UEFA Euro 2024 is almost upon us, and there are three big questions on everyone's lips. Who's going to win it? Who are going to be the dark horses? And if each of the 24 national teams at the tournament could bring back one legend from their country's past at their peak, who would it be and why? Whilst many column inches, airtime, and indeed YouTube videos have been dedicated to answering the first two, the third one, despite everyone thinking about it, has surprisingly been all too often overlooked. Well, today we're going to fix all of that. This is a video that I make before every Euros and World Cup, and I enjoy it every time. So that's good for me. It combines nostalgia, not only for some of the greatest players of all time when talking about the strongest national teams, but also lesser known legends from the smaller and more obscure nations at the tournament, as well as a heavy emphasis on the current squads and likely starting 11s because if you could bring back just one legend, you want to make sure that you bring one back that is going to make the biggest possible impact. If Slovakia's greatest player of all time was a centre forward, who won multiple Ballon d'Ors and averaged a goal a game in the 1990s for example, but they were stacked in attacking areas heading into this tournament, and looked far weaker defensively, you may well pick a defender from the nation's past, rather than their GOAT, if you felt that they would make a bigger impact. As it happens, Slovakia's GOAT isn't a centre forward, and they're also not stacked in attacking areas coming into this tournament. So it's not as simple as picking every country's greatest player, albeit they will obviously sometimes be the best candidate. Otherwise, I would just direct you to my video about the greatest footballer of all time from every single country in Europe, not just the 24 at the Euros. Anyway, I find it fun. It always creates some interesting discourse and different ideas. And uh, why am I still talking? Let's get straight into it. Without further ado then, who was born in Ghana and represented the United States, so couldn't possibly be brought back by any teams of the Euros. I don't even know why you brought him up. Here is, in my view, the one legend every national team should bring back at their peak, if they could, a Euro 2024. Germany. Gerd Müller. Germany may have gone out in the group stage of the last two World Cups and the round of 16 at Euro 2020, but underestimate them on home soil at your own peril. They come into this tournament with a gifted squad, hitting form at the right moment, and arguably, the best head coach at the Euros. Nonetheless, this isn't a formidable Germany squad by historic standards, and there are a few areas of the pitch where German legends could make a massive difference. One of them is a left-back, where either Leipzig's David Raum or Stuttgart's Maximilian Mittelstadt will start, neither of whom are bad players, but nor are they even in the same stratosphere as great German left-backs, like Andreas Brehm and Karl-Heinz Schnellinger, both of whom sadly died in 2024. Another is in holding midfield, where Robert Andrick is now expected to partner Tony Kroos, as the latter bids farewell to the world of football, but as well as he has played for Bayer Leverkusen this season, Andrick has only won three caps at the age of 29, with the likes of Lothar Matthäus, Paul Breitner, and Michael Ballack available as legendary alternatives. Even right back, with Joshua Kimmich, who you could then push into midfield, would be an option, paving the way for someone like Bertie Vots. To be honest, outside of Antonio Rudiger, the entire Germany backline could do with an upgrade, which is why I contemplated picking Germany's greatest player of all time, Franz Beckenbauer, who also died in 2024, to try and tie things together. That would be an excellent selection, if I do say so myself, but in the end, I have chosen to add some goals to a Germany team that could perhaps be found wanting in that department at Euro 2024. Germany have wide players and number 10s coming out of their rivals, with the likes of Gundogan, Sane, Musiala, Wurz and Thomas Muller, and Julian Nagelsmann will most likely play another one of them, Kai Havertz, as a sort of false nine at the Euros, just as Mikel Arteta did throughout much of this season. Havertz is a brilliant footballer in very good form, with Nicholas Fulkrug and Dennis Undav capable of coming off the bench and changing the dynamic of Germany's attack. But I still think that swapping Havertz for Gerd Muller is the single biggest upgrade that you could make to this team. Muller scored 68 goals in only 62 games for West Germany, beat Franz Beckenbauer and Johan Cruyff to the 1970 Ballon d'Or, and turned up when it mattered most winning both Euro 72 and the 1974 World Cup, and scoring three goals across those two finals. Scotland. Dennis Law. 
It was much easier picking the problem position that needed rectifying with Scotland, who lack a recognised forward of international quality, sorry Shea Adams, when their two greatest players of all time were both forwards. The difficulty then came in picking between Kenny Dalgleish and the Celtic and Liverpool icon's own hero growing up, Dennis Law. Dalgleish is arguably Scotland's greatest player of all time, Liverpool's greatest player of all time, and the better all-rounder compared to Law, having played his best football as a foil for the more prolific Ian Rush. Law, by contrast, was something like a blend of Dalgleish and Rush, all rolled up into one. Two-footed, brilliant on the ball, an excellent passer, flawless attacking movement, and ridiculously clinical in front of goal. I'd be happy to toss a coin and take either one of them, but Scotland desperately need goals, they only managed one at the last Euros, and Law scored more of them, while still being brilliant at just about everything else, that you could ever wish for in a centre forward. At his peak, in the 1963-64 season, he scored 46 goals in 42 games for Manchester United, five goals in four games for Scotland, and beat the likes of Luis Suarez, Eusebio, and Jimmy Greaves to a Ballon d'Or. An honourable mention goes to Danny McGrain because I think that right back is a bit of an issue for Scotland, but Adams or Shanklin to Law is obviously a much more significant and impactful upgrade. Hungry. Ferenc Pushkash. Sometimes, it can be easy to overthink things. I don't think that there is any one glaring weakness in Hungary's most likely starting 11 at the Euros, and if I did, I wouldn't hesitate to overlook Ferenc Pushkash, as Hungary have had world-class players in every position over the years, and when I say over the years, primarily of course, what I actually mean is over the years between the 1930s and 50s. I wouldn't actually want to dislodge Hungary's likely number 9 at the Euros, Barnabas Varga, who is one of football's all-time great late bloomers, scored 29 goals in 39 games for Ferenc Baros this season, and has scored 4 in 9 for the national team. That pretty much ruled out Sandor Kocsis then, who scored an incredible 75 goals from 68 caps for Hungary, and I would start Ferenc Pushkash ahead of Roland Salai, who I expect to be one of the two attacking midfielders, alongside Dominic Soberslai, behind Varga. I wish this were actually real. Imagine how fun it would be Ferenc Pushkash casually rocking up at his prime, one of the greatest players of all time, and transforming Hungary's prospects at the Euros. Switzerland. Stefan Shepuzat. It is the same story every time that I make one of these videos before a major tournament. Switzerland lack a quality centre forward. In fairness, Harris Seferovic proved me somewhat wrong at the last Euros, scoring three goals and performing very well, but he hasn't even made Murat Yakin's squad this time around, following his move to the United Arab Emirates. It'll probably be AC Milan's Noah Acker 4 through the middle for Switzerland then, who scored 6 goals in 36 games this season, and has scored 2 goals from 21 caps for Switzerland, with Burnley's Zeki Amdouni competing with him for a starting berth. Josef Hugi and Andre Abeglan are the obvious choices therefore, Switzerland's two greatest strikers and arguably players of all time, both of whom I have picked before. But on this occasion, given his familiarity with playing in Germany, unrivaled commitment to the national team, and ability to provide a focal point, I'm going with three-time Ballon d'Or nominee, Stefan Chapuzat. Chapuzat won the Ballon d'Or and the Champions League with Borussia Dortmund, which is where Switzerland would play their round of 16 tie if they were to win Group A. An honourable mention goes to Kiriakos Sforza, another Bundesliga legend, best associated with Bayern Munich and FC Kaiserslautern, who, at his peak, would be a significant upgrade on current Remo Freuler. Spain. Andre Ziniesta. Spain have one of the best squads and one of the best starting 11s at Euro 2024, but there still isn't a single position where a former great couldn't make an enormous impact as a very significant upgrade. Whether that be Ike Casillas instead of Unai Simon, Prime PK Ramos or Puyol at centre-back, Alonso Xavi or Suarez in midfield, Hento or Basora on the flanks, or Raul, Zara, Villa or Torres up front. The player who I think would make the biggest difference, however, especially with Gavi and a resurgent Isco having been ruled out of the Euros, is Andres Iniesta. Arguably Spain's greatest player of all time, Iniesta is the only legend in this video who is actually still playing, for Emirates in the UAE at the age of 40, but I'm hoping that since no one knows about that, 
not even his family members, I can get away with including a Prime Iniesta as a bring backable legend. Technically flawless, endlessly inventive, and almost impossible to dispossess, in place of Fabian Ruiz, Martin Zubamendi, or whoever gets that third spot in the Spanish midfield, alongside Rodri and Pedri, Iniesta would transform the Spain team. Croatia. Stepan Bobek. Strange as it may sound, since central midfield has for so long, and arguably still is, Croatia's strongest position, I do worry about them getting overrun there by Spain, Italy, and potentially others at the Euros. Mateo Kovacic is 30 now, Marcelo Brozovic is 31, and playing in Saudi Arabia, and Luka Modric is almost 39. For that reason, I almost picked Dinamo Zagreb and AC Milan legend Zvonimir Boban with Robert Prozanetsky earning an honourable mention by virtue of his talent, if not necessarily his athleticism or work rate. Left back is another problem position where Branko Zebits could transform the Croatia team. Ultimately though, it is a centre forward who gets the nod again, Stepan Bobek this time, who is, or at least was, arguably Croatia's greatest player of all time, probably second now to Modric. Croatia need goals, they only scored six in six games in qualifying, excluding games against basement boys Latvia, and their front three, with Ivan Perisic, age 35, is lacking a little bit of spark. Bobek averaged better than a goal every other game for club and country, could play anywhere across the front three or as a number 10, and would dovetail nicely with Andre Kramaric. Italy. Roberto Baggio. Italy feel like a bit of an unknown quantity coming into Euro 2024, despite the fact that they are the holders. They've got the bones of a decent squad, built on the back of an excellent Inter Milan team, and complemented by the likes of Alessandro Bongiorno and Federico Chiesa. Nonetheless, there are significant weaknesses, chief among them a lack of goals, creativity, and sheer inspiration. Whereas Italy teams of old were always renowned for their defensive solidity, they also tended to have a standout flair player, or a beast of a centre forward. This team has neither of those things. Up front, Scamacca or Raspadori will lead the line, and Italy greats like Totti, Vieri and Miazza would all make infinitely superior replacements. Meanwhile, Gianni Rivera, Andrea Perlo, and Valentino Mazzola could all inject some much-needed creativity in different ways in midfield. In the end, I went with someone who could do both, and could play anywhere out wide as a striker or as a number 10, and that is, arguably, Italy's greatest player of all time, Roberto Baggio. The Divine Ponytail was one of the most naturally gifted players on the planet during the 1990s, and would almost single-handedly turn Italy from unknown quantities into potential two-time champions. Albania. Panio Pano. Albania did incredibly well to qualify for Euro 2024 as qualifying Group E winners ahead of the Czech Republic and Poland, but in a group with Italy, Croatia and Spain, three giants of international football in recent times, arguably no one at this summer's Euros, faces a tougher task in terms of progression. Albania were resilient in qualifying, only conceding four goals, and they can boast a decent defence of midfield. In the forward areas, they are a little bit more lacking, with an out-of-sorts Armando Breuer and resurgent Raymond I probably providing their greatest threat. For that reason, Albania's GOAT, Panio Pano, a thrilling technical marvel and prolific goalscorer, who was nicknamed the Little Pushkash by sports commentators, due to his diminutive stature but similar style to the Hungarian great, is my choice for the beautiful country of Albania. No. I haven't been sponsored by the Albanian Tourist Board. Bizarrely, Pano spent his youth career as a goalkeeper before becoming one of the most renowned forwards in Southeast Europe during the 1960s. Slovenia. Branko Oblak. Slovenia are another team expected to face what we will call an uphill battle at Euro 2024, drawn alongside Denmark, Serbia and England in Group C. In captain Jan Oblak and young Benjamin Sesko, Slovenia have quality at either end of the pitch, but in the heart of their midfield, they're crying out for some genuine quality. Former Stuttgart and Sampdoria man Sretsko Katanets could provide that at the base of their midfield, meanwhile Porto and Benfica legend Zlatko Zlahovic could do it as a number 10, but Slovenia's greatest player of all time, Branko Oblak, could do both. 
a majestic midfield all-rounder, Oblak could break up play, pick a pass, and score a goal. Named in a World Eleven in 1976, alongside Gerd Muller and Franz Beckenbauer, during his time with Schalke, Oblak later won the Bundesliga title at Bayern Munich. He not only add some class to the Slovenia midfield, on and off the ball, he'd elevate their entire team, and is a pretty easy selection for that reason. Denmark. Michael Laudrup. You will do well to find a more pessimistic fanbase heading into this Euros than Denmark from my experience, who seem resigned to the fact that this is the worst squad that they have taken into a tournament in decades. One of the biggest problems for the Danes is that their midfield, featuring familiar faces like Christian Eriksen, Thomas Delaney and Pierre-Emil Hoybjerg, is certainly starting to look a little bit tired. And unless Eriksen can roll back the years, now playing in a much deeper role at Manchester United, if indeed he plays at all, they are going to be lacking in terms of both an engine room and genuine creativity from midfield. Denmark's greatest player of all time, and one of the most gifted players of all time full stop, Michael Laudrup, could certainly fix a lot of those problems. Laudrup's vision, technique, and weight of pass were almost unrivaled throughout much of the 80s and 90s. He would turn a seemingly mediocre Denmark team into quite a frightening prospect, and he could redeem his decision not to represent his country at the Euros in 1992, which they obviously went on to win. Serbia Nemanja Vidic. A modern legend, Nemanja Vidic was born in the former Yugoslavia and made his international debut for Serbia and Montenegro before the two countries formally split in 2006, forming two separate national teams. Serbia have a chance at Euro 2024, at least of making the round of 16, if not the quarterfinals, with a formidable front three of Sergei Milinkovic Savic, Dusan Tadic, and Aleksandar Mitrovic, even if they do have an average age of over 30, and two of the three are now playing in Saudi Arabia, supported by Dusan Vlahovic and Luka Jovic. Serbia have historically tended to be strong at the back, most famously in 2006 World Cup qualifying, when they set a record for the fewest goals conceded. Now, however, you're looking at the likes of Red Bull Salzburg's Trehinja Pavlovic and Spartak Moscow's Serjan Babic getting a start, alongside Fiorentina's Nikola Milenkovic, who is the pick of the bunch. For that reason, ahead of even Dragan Jarch, who is comfortably Serbia's greatest player of all time, I've picked Nemanja Vidic, who was at the heart of that ironclad 2006 World Cup qualifying backline, as my pick for Serbia. He'd make a vulnerable backline look a lot more solid, as well as bring in valuable elite level experience and winning mentality to a team that is a little bit lacking on both fronts. England. Ashley Cole. England have had several better players than Ashley Cole over the years, any of whom I could have picked, but the reality is, England are stacked and blessed in attacking areas heading into Euro 2024, and the real weaknesses are at left-back, Declan Rice's midfield partner, and arguably at centre-back, alongside John Stones. Even if Harry Maguire has formed a very effective partnership with Stones at three successive tournaments, making that one feel a little bit less urgent. Midfield would be easy to strengthen, with any one of Brian Robson, my personal pick, Duncan Edwards, or even a late-stage Paul Scholes, capable of complementing Rice, adding real quality, and balancing the side. As would centre-back for that matter, through any one of John Terry, Rio Ferdinand, Bobby Moore, or the indomitable Neil Franklin. I think left-back is the most glaring weakness, though, and whereas I have hoped that Kobi Mainu, for example, could have a brilliant breakout tournament alongside Rice, and Maguire could become a cult hero once again at centre-back, I am much less confident or hopeful when I look at England's options at left-back, at least assuming that Luke Shaw doesn't make some kind of miraculous comeback. For that reason, I've gone with Ashley Cole, who was the best left-back on the planet for a period of time at his peak, and just about the only member of England's golden generation who replicated his club form on the international stage and never let anyone down. Well, on the pitch at least. He'd add phenomenal balance to the team, going forward and defending, and if only he were added and not, you know, all of the other country's legends, I think that he would make England favourites to win the Euros. I know that they are already one of the two favourites, but I mean my favourites. Poland. Zbigniew Boniak. 
The ecstasy of overcoming Wales on penalties to qualify for Euro 2024 was soon followed by the reality of being drawn in a group with France, Austria and the Netherlands for Poland this summer. It's a tough task for Poland, whose star men, Robert Lewandowski and Wojciech Szczesny, are 35 and 34 years of age. You could make big improvements in almost every outfield position, but in midfield and on the flanks are where Poland are most desperately in need of an upgrade. The country's two greatest players, other than Lewandowski, Zbigniew Boniek and Kazimierz Steiner, have the answers, as does arguably their fourth greatest player, Gregory Zlato, who was a rapid and incredibly prolific right winger. It is tough to pick between Boniek and Dina, but although I think Dina was probably the superior technician and even more of a genius, Boniek's versatility and energy in a Poland midfield that needs both silk and steel adding, not just a luxury player, just about gives him the edge. The Netherlands. Johan Cruyff. The easiest decision in this entire video, Johan Cruyff isn't just the greatest Dutch footballer of all time, and probably the greatest European, he's also basically the perfect legend for the current Netherlands team to bring back. Ronald Koeman is blessed with some quality centre-backs, excellent full-backs or wing-backs, and a strong midfield base with Toon Koop Miners and Frankie de Jong. In front of them, however, is neither the flair nor the firepower that we have come to expect of great Dutch teams in previous generations. A probable front three of young Javi Simons, Cody Hakpo, and most likely Wout Weghorst is miles off Netherlands teams that could boast Ruud Hullet, Marco van Basten, Dennis Bergkamp, and Mark Overmars, among many others. The greatest of them all, of course, and a man who had more flair and firepower than almost anyone else who has ever played the game, was Johan Cruyff. A man who was born with a ball at his feet, found football so easy that he decided to revolutionise the game tactically before he'd even hung up his boots, and averaged a goal a game in his teens, Cruyff won three successive Ballon d'Ors at his peak, and would transform the Netherlands team from outsiders to one of the favourites in an instant. Austria Joseph Bikan. There's real excitement about Austria coming into the Euros, only somewhat tempered by starman David Alaba being ruled out by injury. Alaba is Austria's greatest player of the modern era, but not of all time. Matthias Schindler is one of the most gifted and significant footballers of all time, pioneering the role of the withdrawn forward. Meanwhile, Ernst Ockwork was considered one of the best and most complete midfielders on the planet for more than a decade. Incidentally, centre-forward and holding midfield are probably the two positions where Austria's current team are in most need of an upgrade, but I have gone with the blunt speed, athleticism and goal-scoring prowess of Bikan rather than the technique, creativity and vision of Schindler in a withdrawn role this time around. Bikan scored 780 goals in 492 games at club level, 29 in 34 for three different national teams, one of them being Austria, and could run the 100 metres in 10.8 seconds, almost comparable to Olympic sprinters at the time. It is harsh on Michael Gregorich, who has had a good season at Freiburg and has been excellent for the national team under Ralf Rangnick, but it's hard to overlook a man who could outrun a fighter jet and literally averaged over two goals a game at his peak. France. Patrick Vieira. Maybe I am horribly overthinking this one. Let me know what you think in the comments. The obvious answer with France is just to pick a centre forward, either Juste Fontaine, Jean-Pierre Papin or Thierry Henry as a replacement for 37-year-old Olivier Giroud, who a lot of people would, quite reasonably consider, to be the weak link in this star-studded France team. There is a reason, however, why Deschamps is so loyal to Giroud, even heading into his last tournament, and that is because he loves a target man, he always has, and France's setup under him is reliant upon having a focal point who can hold the ball up, bring others into the game, and provide an aerial presence. None of Fontaine, Papin, or Henri, all far better strikers, it should be said, than France's all-time leading goalscorer, come close to fitting that profile. Maybe Eric Cantona would be an option, but honestly, I'm not even wholly convinced that Deschamps would start prime Cantona ahead of a 37-year-old Giroud, and not just because he called him a water carrier in their playing days, so that felt like a wasted pick. In the end, 
I went for Patrick Vieira as a massive Adrian Rabi upgrade in midfield, partnering Arelli and Chouamaini in a double pivot, slightly ahead of him, with Antoine Griezmann playing as the number 10. Zinedine Zidane or Michel Platini would be more popular selections, but neither offer the defensive protection or work rate that Rabio does, and that Vieira could comfortably replicate whilst improving the team significantly, both on and off the ball. An honourable mention for Lilian Toram, who would be a big upgrade on either Jonathan Klaus or Jules Koundé at right back, which is probably actually France's weakest starting position, heading into this summer's Euros. Belgium, Vincent Kompany. It feels as though everyone has written Belgium off following their poor showing at the last World Cup, Eden Hazard's demise and eventual retirement, and the accompanying ageing of the rest of their so-called golden generation. I get it, but when you take a step back, they still have a very decent midfield three and front three, which should cause any team in this tournament problems, even if I do find the decision to leave Thibaut Courtois out of the squad entirely, when he's just started and won a Champions League final, keeping a clean sheet, a little bit odd. The problem for Belgium, as far as I see it, is the probable car crash pairing of a 37-year-old Jan Vertonghen and Leicester City's sideshow bob impersonator, Wout Facet centre-back. Just as Belgium's attacking talent can cause anyone problems, any team at Euro 2024, and I really do mean any team, is capable of giving those two a hard time. For that reason, I picked Belgium's greatest ever centre-back, the only fairly recently retired and very recently appointed Bayern Munich manager Vincent Kompany as their legend to bring back. At his best, Kompany wasn't just one of the best centre-backs in the world, he was also a brilliant leader and communicator, possibly even good enough to guide Fass, or whoever partners him, through games. Slovakia, Jan Poplua. Francesco Calzona, who is currently managing both Napoli and Slovakia, has done a brilliant job in turning Slovakia into a team in which the whole is far greater than the sum of its parts, and ultimately, in qualifying for Euro 2024. But the reality is, on an individual basis, there are deficiencies all over the pitch that former greats could immeasurably improve. For that reason, Jan Poplua is the obvious choice, as comfortably Slovakia's greatest player of all time, who is likely to have the biggest impact on the entire team, even as a sweeper. It wouldn't improve Slovakia's ailing attack, which caused me to consider Andrei Kvajnak, Josef Adametz, and of course, Mara Kamzik, but Poplua was in a different league, so they'll just have to hang on and try and take every game to penalties. One of Czechoslovakia's greatest ever players, at a World Cup finalist in 1962, Poplua made the World Soccer World XI in 1964, 1967, and again in 1968, featuring alongside the likes of Eusebio, Pele, and Alfredo Di Stefano, even from behind the Iron Curtain. Romania, Georgi Hadji. An obvious choice in some ways, but legends could also significantly improve Romania in every position, so it made sense to pick one of the country's three greatest players, namely Georgi Hadji, Nikolai Dobrin, or Georgi Popescu. Dobrin was arguably even more gifted than Hadji, but ultimately, Hadji's fire, explosivity, and reverence in Romania made him the obvious choice. He would not only become Romania's best player and transform their attacking dynamic, he'd act as a talisman, inspiring a sense of belief in Romania's fans and players alike going into every game, just as he did at the 1994 World Cup, earning him a fourth place finish in that year's Ballon d'Or voting. Ukraine, Ole Blocky. Two of the greatest Eastern European footballers in quick succession, it was less easy picking who to bring back for Ukraine because they do have some attacking talent, but ultimately, scoring goals was still their biggest problem in Euro qualifying. I overlooked Andrei Shevchenko on the basis that he was more of an out-and-out centre-forward, and I would be reluctant to replace Ertem Dovbik up front, who scored 24 goals in 36 games this season in his debut La Liga campaign, winning the division's golden boot. Ole Blocking, by contrast, who is also probably the greatest Ukrainian footballer of all time, if we're honest, could play on the left, probably forcing Mikhailo Mudrik onto the right, as a replacement for Hiori Sudikov, or as a direct replacement for Viktor Sienko as a number 10, or withdrawn forward in behind Dovbik. Blocking was a nine-time Ukrainian Footballer of the Year award winner, 
five-time Soviet Top League top scorer and four-time Ballon d'Or nominee, winning the award in 1975 after winning a Soviet Top League and UEFA Cup Winners' Cup double with Dynamo Kiev to comfortably pit Franz Beckenbauer and Johan Cruyff to that year's crown. Turkey. Hakan Şuka. I'm not sure that Hakan Şuka would even want to represent Turkey at this moment in time, given that he is wanted for arrest by the authoritarian Erdogan regime, and has been living in exile in the United States since 2016, but hey-ho, assuming that he would, I've gone and picked him anyway. Lots of people's dark horses at Euro 2020, Turkey have a half-decent team with lots of gifted and creative wingers and midfielders. What they lack, above all else, is someone who can put the ball in the back of the net. With Enes Unal, who scored two goals in 22 games for Getafe and Bournemouth this season, but was still expected to be Turkey's starting centre-forward, having been ruled out of the Euros with a broken toe. That means someone like Cenk Tosun, or even 18-year-old Semi Çilatsoy, is likely to be thrown up there, and it also means that it is the most ripe area for improvement. I could easily have picked Zeki Riza Spirel or Metin Oktay, two legendary Turkish forwards of yesteryear, but they played in eras where it is markedly more difficult to judge the quality of Turkish football in relation to other countries and leagues, or at least to judge it favourably. Political exile Hakan Şuka, by contrast, scored 46 goals in 39 games for Galatasaray in his best season in the 1990s, as well as 51 goals from 112 caps for Turkey, making him the country's all-time leading goalscorer. Georgia. Mertaz Kurtzalava. Georgia have done amazingly well to qualify for their first ever tournament at Euro 2024, and I'm delighted to say that I'll be attending at least two of their group games at the Euros, and hopefully making a documentary about their journey both to and at the Euros for my second channel, Alfie Potts Armour. Yes, that was a plug, go and subscribe, and also check out my first ever video on there. Critics have described it as masterful, eye-opening, and, uh... Alfie is looking fat these days. Cheers, Adam. Anyway, much as I am fascinated by Georgia's journey, they probably have the weakest squad of any team at Euro 2024 on paper, and every air of the pitch is ripe for improvement. Levan Kobeshvili could add real quality at left wing back, Kaka Kaladze could add rare elite ability to Georgia's back three, David Kipiani would be by far the best player in Georgia's midfield, Mikhail Meski could add speed and dynamism on the opposite flank to Georgia's current star man, Kvitsa Gvaras Helia, and Shotar Abaladze would give them genuine threat in front of goal. My choice, after much deliberation, and I mean that, is Mertes Kurtzalava, a brilliant defender who won 69 caps as a mainstay in a fantastic Soviet national team between 1965 and 1973, during which time they reached the final of the Euros. He is probably the greatest Georgian footballer of all time, and I doubt that any other could have a bigger or more instant impact upon this current Georgia team's fortunes. Czech Republic, Joseph Masipust. I said that it wasn't as simple as just picking every team's greatest player of all time, but on at least nine occasions, or 37.5% of the time, that is exactly what I've done. Joseph Masipust is the latest case, a midfield marvel who inspired Czechoslovakia to a World Cup final in 1962 and won a Ballon d'Or for his efforts. He is one of two Czech Ballon d'Or winners, of course, along with Pavel Nedved, and he, Frantisek Planitska, Petr Cech, and the great Aldrik Nejedli all entered my thinking. Masipus takes the crown not only because he is the greatest and most complete of the lot, capable of running the midfield and dictating a game, but also because that is an area of weakness in this current Czech team. Tomas Suchek is nailed on to start, but whilst he is excellent off the ball, he is limited on it, and I would have Masipus replace FC Twente's Mikhail Sadalek, who I expect to partner Suchek in Ivan Hasek's midfield. Portugal. Eusebio. At the end of an epic video, it is last stop Portugal, who undoubtedly have one of the most talented squads at Euro 2024, without too many major weaknesses. Roberto Martinez's side have a strong midfield, centre-backs, left-back, and attack. 
I don't trust Nelson Semedo, not personally, as in, you know, to look after my luggage at an airport if I went to the toilet or something. I don't know the man, but I assume he is perfectly honourable, but I mean when he's playing football. For that reason, I considered Porto legend Ivo Pinto, who was an outstanding right back, but as you have probably gathered from this video by this point, with the exception of England, I consider it a bit of a waste to bring back a fullback when you have the choice of every legend that a country has ever had. Ultimately, and I know that it won't be a popular opinion, I have picked Eusebio as a probable replacement for Cristiano Ronaldo at centre forward. Look, they're obviously Portugal's two greatest players of all time, and clearly no one in their right mind would want to replace a prime Ronaldo. He is now 39 years old though, he was underwhelming at best, and actively a distraction for Portugal at worst at the last World Cup, and I know that he's bagged a goal a game in the Saudi Pro League this season, but so too has Alexander Mitrovic. Eusebio, in his prime, was one of the greatest centre forwards, and indeed players, of all time. He had a better goal-scoring record than Ronaldo, and an even more prolific peak, scoring a frankly ludicrous 46 goals in 28 games in the 1963-64, and 50 goals in 35 games in the 1967-68 seasons. He would be the best centre-forward at the tournament, and, for my money, he'd make Portugal the favourite, so, you know, on that basis, I think that he's the right choice. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. I hope that was the case. As I said, I always do, so, you know, that's one person at least. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Make sure that you are subscribed, not just for this channel, HITC7s, but also to my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, which now has its first video, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me uh, on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, should you wish to do so. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more good stuff, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.